Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Melanie Paris, and I'm the Senior Director of Health Initiatives and Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Before I turn the presentation over to today's speaker, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screen. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled Questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website, kidneyfund.org slash webinars within the next one to two weeks. For those of you in attendance who are health professionals, we are glad that you've joined us today and hope you'll recommend this webinar to the patients you work with. As a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credits. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, we will be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. Without further ado, allow me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Poyapakam Srivas. Dr. Srivas is currently at the medical center, medical director, sorry, of Frixis Services at Texas Children's Hospital. This program provides acute and chronic services with treatment for both congenital and acquired kidney disease. He has a strong commitment to providing excellent patient and family care to many communities in the Houston area. Additionally, he is an associate professor of the renal section in the Department of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Srivats is eager to showcase pediatric nephrology and spread awareness about kidney disease. Thank you, Dr. Srivats, for joining us. Um, thank you. Um, and really for those kind words. And I would say a flattering picture of myself taken a few years back without a speck of white hair. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Jokes apart, um, thanks for those, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the uh, opportunity to showcase um, pediatric kidney disease, which is a topic which is near and dear to my heart. So without further ado, um, we would proceed with the uh, presentation um, for the next slide. Um, we're going to look at um, what is chronic kidney disease. The definition of chronic kidney disease um, is uh, not very much different than what it is, uh, what, how it is defined in adults. It's defined as abnormalities of structure or function of the kidneys, which is present for more than three months. The main signs of kidney damage um, we look at are alterations in the filtering function of the kidney, and that why we measure um, by a term called glomerular filtration rate, which shows how much blood is filtered through the glomeruli in 60 seconds, that is about a minute. Normal is close to about 100 mils per minute corrected for body size. Less than 60 mils per minute for 1.73 would imply kidney damage. The other important sign of kidney damage that we look for is having too much protein in the urine, which is defined as albuminuria. We could see some damages also in imaging, which would also imply that there is chronic kidney disease. So we go to the next slide. We will look at uh, the uh, glomerular filtration rate in regards to, with regards to children. So though we can measure this glomerular filtration rate, the most common method of, of looking at glomerular filtration rate is by estimating from a common lab test that we would do, which is called a serum creatinine. In, um, health, for healthcare providers, as well as for um, 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 patient caregivers, um, it is this, this lab value, meaning EGFR, estimated uh, glomerular filtration rate, is actually provided by labs, national laboratories uh, for adults. However, since the normal values are different in children, we have to correct and provide that either at the clinic visit or over the phone um, and when, we, when we measure that uh, GFR. So it's important for um, um, both the healthcare providers as well as the patients and their providers to at the clinic visit to make sure that you talk about what is my uh, estimated GFR. 
to your healthcare providers. As we go to the next slide, um, so once we know uh, what the um, EGFR is, the next step in um, defining chronic kidney disease is really stage it. Why do we stage chronic kidney disease? The reason why we do it is because certain changes in the body or complications occur at certain GFR levels, and this is irrespective of what the cause of chronic kidney disease is. So the common staging that is done in adults, as we look at the next slide, is um, looking at different levels of kidney function and having these stages. The stage progresses from one to five, with five being the worst, where your GFR is less than 15. So um, if you can go to the next slide. However, in children, um, we know that the GFR normalizes only by two years of age. For example, a healthy newborn can have a glomerular filtration rate of 40. So, um, when we go to the next slide, in, when, when it comes to children, we, we stage chronic dis kidney disease only when our children are more than two years old because it takes that much time to reach adult values. Obviously, um, they can have chronic kidney disease if they have changes in their, say, an ultrasound or an imaging modality. So the duration may not be more than three months to say that the patient has chronic kidney disease, say if it's a newborn. And in lieu of albuminuria, we can actually use urine protein to uh, say how much protein is excreted. So as we go to the next slide, we will see that proteinuria is also graded um, in children, starting from A1, where you have a minimal protein excretion to all the way to A3 when it is severely increased. And why do we do that? If you go to the next slide. Why have proteinuria and classification? The reason why we have proteinuria and classification is because proteinuria by itself, independent of your level of kidney function, would determine how fast your kidney disease will progress. For example, if you look at 3A, and you would, you would see in the first column, if you have minimal proteinuria, you only have moderate risk of progression. However, if you have the same level of kidney function at 3A, but your proteinuria is severe, then you would progress much faster. Is this true in children? That's what we're going to look at. Um, can we have the next slide? So for, for doing that, we had two important studies that were done in pediatric um, kidney disease patients, and it is important to, um, I think, pay tribute to both these studies. And the first one is actually an ongoing study, uh, which is done in um, children with chronic kidney, disease, chronic kidney disease from U.S. and Canada, where it follows these children over a period of time uh, to see what happens to their kidney function and its implications. The second study, which is called as the ESCAPE study, was done in Europe where children with moderate kidney disease were either given standard control of blood pressure or the other group had intensified treatment and showed that those with strict blood pressure control had worse progression. So combining these two studies cohorts of patients, the studies to study group of patients, we go to the next slide, we would see that um, proteinuria definitely determines progression even in children. So this slide actually shows the same classification that we had used before where there are different stages of kidney disease with different levels of proteinuria. And we, when we look at the progression, and you go to the next slide, we show that whatever your kidney disease cost may be, if you have high degree of proteinuria, when you look at that last column, you would say that those who have mild proteinuria had much less progression of kidney disease. And the, la and the, the one in red, which is highlighted, their kidney disease progressed to receiving dialysis even within a year if they had severe degrees of proteinuria. So um, as we take a pause, we know that Kidney disease um, um, is determined 
uh, in a similar fashion to adults with a couple of caveats. And proteinuria is an important risk factor, be it in adults or in children. So the next step is to look at the causes of end stage, causes of kidney disease. We do not have a national registry of the causes of chronic kidney disease, but we do have a national registry of uh, those receiving dialysis. So you, when you look at the picture that is on your um, left-hand side, you would look at the causes of end-stage renal disease in adults, which shows nearly 75% of causes of end-stage renal disease is by either diabetes or hypertension. Whereas in children, the maximum contribution comes from hereditary or congenital diseases. In fact, when you look at the diabetes, it's a small sliver that contributes to in stage renal disease. Next slide. And the, um, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the abnormalities, that is congenital of the kidney and the urinary tract, play such an important role um, in causing kidney disease in children such that the, the, some of the important obstructive lesions, which are the abnormalities, happens much more in boys. And for that main reason, looks like boys have higher prevalence of chronic kidney disease in children when compared to girls. Next slide. So we would look at these common causes of chronic kidney disease in children as examples. The first one is when you have um, kidneys that are small. So either they can have small kidneys with low number of filters, or they can have malformed kidney tissue. Either way, we call them as hypodysplasia or dysplasia, which is causing um, kidney disease in children. The next slide shows a, um, a, a pictorial representation of the same, where the first, the, the picture on the, on the left shows a normal kidney, whereas you can clearly see on your right-hand side that you have a kidney which is small, bright, and with some cyst. This is called as a renal hypodysplasia with some cyst, and this is likely the most common cause of kidney disease in children. The next um, important cause of kidney disease in children, um, which has big implications, is having a blockage to the urinary tract. So there is a pictorial representation of the urinary tract, which shows the kidney, and then the, um, the drain pipes of the kidney, so-called the ureter, which drains the urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder, and then a second tube, which drains the bladder from, which drains from the bladder to outside, which is called the urethra. And if you have a blockage in the urethra, it's called as the posterior urethral valve, and that is due to a persistent tissue in that part of that urethra. It happens only in males, and that is one of the most common causes of obstruction and most common cause of chronic kidney disease in children. You can have obstruction at different levels, be at the level of the kidney and the ureter or the level of the ureter and the bladder, which are not very as common as the posterior urethral valve. So next slide. This is a pictorial representation of the same. You can see that the picture on the left-hand side shows a sort of a normal urethral anatomy, whereas the picture on the um, right side shows that there is dilatation of the urethra because of an obstruction at the level of the urethral valve. So that is regarding the um, causes of kidney disease in children as when compared to adults. So um, clearly the congenital anomalies play an important role. So the next step is to, what do we do once we know that you have chronic kidney disease and once we have defined why you have chronic kidney disease in children? The next role is to see um, uh, what are the next steps in management, and it is all based on the function of the kidney. So we know that the kidneys are filters, but they do much more than filtration. They're important as uh, our body's chemists, maintaining water and electrolyte balance. They get rid of some harmful substances, such as the common drugs that we take are excreted by the kidneys. They are the master regulators of blood pressure. They regulate red blood cell production and therefore are important. Um, uh, for maintaining um, good energy levels, and they balance minerals in the body, and therefore are very important for maintaining good bone health. So, as we see in the next slide, all our uh, steps of management stem from the function of the kidney. So, if you have 
alterations in water and electrolyte balance, then you can accumulate fluid. That's where fluid overload comes from. You can accumulate electrolytes such as potassium and can have buildup of acid. Similarly, we talk about why it is important to know what your kidney function is and how it is important in drug dosing and avoiding medications that affect the kidney. M management of detecting and management of hypertension also is critical in, 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 uh, in chronic kidney disease management. That is primarily because of its role of kidney as a master regulator of blood pressure. And similarly, we will look at anemia and um, mineral bone disorder. So the first, uh, as we go to the next slide, the first uh, step you, we're going to concentrate on is nutrition. It's extremely important in infants and young children to address nutritional needs. Protein energy malnutrition occurs to close to about 10% of, of infants and children, of young infants, young children and infants with chronic kidney disease. Multiple contributing factors, including not having a good appetite, which, is, which could be a complication of chronic kidney disease. The assessment includes things that you normally do when you are a pediatrician looking at height and weight, as well as additional lab values. I want to hear stress on the importance of having um, um, a good renal dietitian, um, which is, I think, of paramount importance in, um, in uh, really management of chronic kidney disease in children, um, because your dietitian helped to not only pick the diet, but modify by adding some materials, adding some food materials to the diet, which could include, which could increase the caloric and protein count and therefore increase growth, but not add, but not add the damaging electrolytes of minerals. It may be necessary to sometimes provide um, enteral nutrition by an isogastric or a gastrostomy tube because anorexia plays such an important, uh, is an important complication of CKD in children. Occasionally in dialysis, um, in hemodialysis particularly, we may provide uh, parental nutrition. It is also important to have a child life and psychologist involved if you have difficulty in adhering to this diet. The next slide. Um, impaired growth um, is a very common complication of chronic kidney disease uh, and, and exclusively seen obviously in children. So, and it has huge psychological impact and can definitely negatively impact our quality of life. About a third of children um, with moderate CKD have a height below the third percentile, of, third percentile for age. Multiple causes contribute to it. We are going to focus on one issue of uh, growth hormone resistance. Growth hormone, which is a hormone that is important for growth in all children, is not really deficient in children with chronic kidney disease, but they get into a pattern of almost partial resistance to growth hormone. This can be actually be overcome by administering growth hormone. Uh, currently, with the recombinant growth hormone that is available, complications are not very common, and it's an approved indication for use of growth hormone. However, even with that, less than one in four children, of uh, one in four eligible children really receive growth hormone. So we really, as healthcare providers as well, we have to pay much more attention to this issue. Next slide. So the other um, important uh, area of um, chronic kidney disease is looking at their, um, really their bone strength and their uh, um, bone disease. So in kidney, kidneys are important for uh, getting rid of phosphorus from our body. So when your kidneys don't work, you retain phosphorus. You also don't make enough um, vitamin, active levels of vitamin D. Both these can cause an elevation of a hormone called parathyroid hormone. As we go to the next slide, we will see with how complex this interaction is. But the take home point of this slide really is to look and see that with these alterations in your minerals, such as phosphate and decreased calcium, you not only have changes in the bone, but also changes in your blood vessels and heart. So it's important that we focus on a patient as a whole with its implications of mineral balance, not only to the bone, but also to the vascular tissue. Next slide. And these are the hormones that we talked about, the PTH, bone changes, calcium, and phosphate. <clears throat> 
how do we treat this? Um, we talk about um, uh, restriction of phosphorus, and this again, and uh, the dietitians play such a crucial role in, in um, prescribing a diet that is low in phosphorus, um, and use of phosphate binders. We can use uh, um, either an active form of vitamin D or um, the calciferol, which is a commonly available known vitamin D, um, such as ergo or cholecalciferol, um, to treat this uh, problem. But it's important to pay attention that we do not cause too much arrays of calcium in our blood, particularly in children who have completed their bone growth, because we can cause vascular calcification. As we move on to the next slide, we will talk about the other aspect of uh, uh, metabolic acidosis. Next slide. So metabolic acidosis happens because you retain a lot of phosphate and sulfate, um, and you're not able to excrete it. So your buildup of acid happens, and that can cause um, trouble with growth and can cause problems with bone. We usually treat it with giving some supplemental bicarb or citrate solutions, but it's important to treat it so that you can ensure adequate growth. Next slide. As in many, many situations in pediatrics, um, the normal values change with age and sometimes gender, and so these are the normal values of hemoglobin um, that is used to define anemia. In adults, there is one value, but in children, there are different values. Next slide. Why does anemia happen in chronic kidney disease? Um, it happens because of two important uh, components. One, healthy kidneys make a hormone called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin, that hormone sends a signal to the body that it has to make red blood cells. If you don't make enough red blood cells, you become anemic. The uh, red blood cells are red because they have a protein called hemoglobin, and iron is such a critical component of that hemoglobin and because of either frequent blood draws or not having enough iron to the, to the right organ, uh, iron deficiency is very common in, in children with chronic kidney disease. Almost half of um, uh, children with chronic kidney disease seem to have iron deficiency. Next slide. The way we treat anemia, um, next slide. The way we treat anemia is either by administering the uh, hormone, which is erythropoietin, and that can be given either subcutaneously or intravenously if you're on hemodialysis, and providing iron. Nearly all children with CKD uh, who are anemic need iron, and iron is usually prescribed as an oral route, but sometimes with chronic kidney disease, you have iron regulatory proteins being altered, and one of that is called hepcidin, and that would not let iron be absorbed by given by oral route. So we may have to do intravenous forms of iron. Next slide. Um, this is an important slide because strict blood pressure control is probably the only intervention that has been shown to slow progression of chronic kidney disease in children. And that is comes directly from that large study that we talked about before called the ESCAPE study. The main um, medications and the, and the medication group that is are that are the preferred agents for treating blood pressure are either ACE inhibitors, um, such medications such as enalapril, or angiotensin receptor blockade medications such as losartan. These are these are the preferred agents for treatment of high blood pressure in children with chronic kidney disease. There may be some side effects because of alterations of blood flow when we start these medications. So your healthcare provider may check. Uh, levels of electrolytes, and your kidney function right after starting these medications. Next slide. Shifting gears, um, this is such a unique aspect of, um, um, of a developmental delay being a unique aspect of uh, chronic kidney disease in children that we need to pay um, careful consideration for this. Um, it happens much more um, when kidney failure happens in infancy. But even with mild to moderate chronic kidney disease, um, there is impairment in measures of um, um, IQ, academic achievement, and attention regulation. And the factors which make it worse are the factors that cause increased progression as well. Things like elevated blood pressure, lower 
um, um, glomerular filtration rate. It's very important to really pay attention to this um, because it has huge implications, not only in um, how we uh, approach our children with chronic kidney disease, but also even for things like medication adherence. Multiple studies have looked at quality of life, which is also lower. So the next step is to talk about progression. So what happens to chronic kidney disease when you have, what happens to uh, further when you have chronic kidney disease? Unfortunately, once you have chronic kidney disease, since the other uh, filters have to overwork to compensate, there is usually a slow decline of kidney function over time. However, this decline is not in a straight line fashion. If you have somebody who is starting off with a um, fairly mild chronic kidney disease, it may take longer to progress. Whereas if you are in the later stages, this progression can happen pretty quickly. Next slide. The factors that are associated with progression are, one, somebody who has a, a glomerular cause um, of kidney disease progresses faster than the congenital abnormalities of kidney and the urinary tract. Definitely genetic predisposition is there, uh, and we are discovering much more of this. This is a topic that is going to come uh, into attention much more. Um, those who are, then the severity of CKD, meaning those who have a worsened CKD, as we talked about in the previous slide, will progress faster. Those who have worse proteinuria, so the degree of baseline proteinuria, those who have worse, progress faster. Puberty is such an important um, time to look at progression uh, as shown in these large italic study, which showed that there was worsening of renal function during puberty, whether it is due to pubertal hormones or accelerated growth during puberty, just have to see. When you have somebody with chronic kidney disease and you have episodes of acute kidney injury on top of it, it causes worsening of the disease. And similarly, things like urinary tract infections as well as obstruction can cause worsening of kidney disease. We talked about how high blood pressure is such of a paramount importance in determining progression of kidney disease. And as we know more about this in children, I think we are going to discover more factors which are important for progression. Next slide. There are some special considerations um, when you look at chronic kidney disease uh, in children. First is, since congenital abnormalities of the kidney and the urinary tract, what we call it as, it's a mouthful, we call it as CACUT, are important cause of chronic kidney disease, some of them, some of these children make a lot of urine, and sometimes they may waste sodium. So as opposed to adults with chronic kidney disease, you may have to give them sodium supplements for them to grow. We do not recommend restricting their protein intake because protein intake is so important for their development and growth. In children where we have obstructive uropathy, we have to make sure that there is good bladder emptying and drainage. And urologist becomes a, such an important addition to your team who's taking care of chronic kidney disease. And in some children who have repeated urinary tract infections, either appropriate bladder drainage or prophylactic antibiotics are necessary to help prevent further progression. Next slide. So when your chronic kidney disease um, progresses and you're close to um, 40 to 45 percent of uh, uh, function, then you have to initiate conversations uh, about um, renal replacement therapy. We did not start it at that time, but that conversation should be initiated. It is important to realize that for more, many children with progressive CKD, getting a transplant before dialysis so-called preemptive transplantation, is the preferred treatment. That is because you have much longer graft life as well as um, less mortality when we, use, uh, when we do preemptive transplantation and avoid dialysis. However, in some children where we cannot avoid dialysis and we want to perform hemodialysis, then consideration should be given, and if you're looking at a long time of on being on dialysis, such as, say, um, somebody with transplant who now has failed and go on to chronic kidney disease, then we have to think about placement of an arterial venous fistula a few months before starting dialysis, and that way we can utilize it. Similarly, for, if peritoneal dialysis is the preferred modality, 
then suitability of home should be explored ahead of time and um, catheter should be inserted at least two weeks prior to its anticipated use. Next slide focuses on um, what we can do as, uh, uh, as um, parents and other caregivers of looking at this. So important for, uh, for parents and, and the caregivers to get help from um, the, your child life or social workers to initiate conversation at an age appropriate level with the children regarding CKD because renal replacement therapy could be in the horizon. Be very much engaged with the healthcare team and start your conversations as we alluded before at 40 to 45 percent of kidney function. And always talk about renal transplantation as the first option and then talk about why we cannot do it or why it is that why we can proceed with it. But remember that renal transplantation is not a cure. It involves taking medications with strict adherence. However, we know that the graft survival is getting better. This is as of recent data from the scientific registry. It is it's welcoming to know that 82% of living donor kidneys transplanted in 2006 are still functioning in 10 years. So it's good news and it's getting better um, as the years go by. Next slide. Um, what are some of the um, 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 important things to think about uh, when, you, when you have a child with CKD? Uh, we do not restrict activity, so encourage exercise and healthy living. A kidney-friendly diet may be the best thing for the whole family. So instead of talking about restrictions, talking, talk about friendly diet. School is the best environment for learning and social interactions. So um, encourage children to be in school. You may need help from your team um, and for accommodations regarding diet or other um, developmental issues. Have conversations at age-appropriate level with your child regarding why. Why do they have to take medications? Why do they have to get shots? Why we need to think about uh, transplant? I think having at their developmental level understanding why makes the job a little easier and makes them a part of the team. Always be an advocate for your child's kidneys. Um, ask about medication side effects, dosing, et cetera, when you have a conversation with other healthcare providers or even an ER visit. Next slide. Children are definitely not small adults, so uh, seek help from a pediatric nephrology team if a child has CKD. CKD management, um, as you've, you've gone through the slides, which would have clearly realized it's always a team approach. You need a dietitian, a social worker, a child life person, and if you're lucky enough, a quality of life coordinator to focus really on the child's development and social and school needs. Definitely, we have to pay attention to blood pressure and treat it with the right medication. We have to talk to their uh, children and, and at their um, age level and developmental uh, level to discuss ways to live with CKD. We should always remember that CKD does not define that child. Every child is supposed to realize their fullest potential, and we have, as a team, had to get there. So I use a, um, a, a visual approach sometimes when we discuss about CKD and being a nephrologist, putting kidney as the center of attention, as you can see, and looking at the various functions of the kidney and what, how we are addressing each of these functions, like anemia, bone health, blood pressure control, nutrition, um, electrolytes, Looking at, and as you can see, the function, the, the people always talk about kidney being filtered, is just one of the functions. Got it. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Srivats, for joining us and leading us in this um, very informative webinar. At this time, I'd like to ask you a few questions we've received over the course of the webinar. Sure. So, yep. um, one is, what kind of dietary changes does a child with kidney disease need to make? Right, right. I think um, as you have uh, listened to the um, um, webinar, um, really that, that dietary changes needs to be individualized for the child's needs, I think. That's important to realize. Um, some children who have 
high blood pressure um, may need the restriction of their sodium. But at the same time, if you have a child who has a lot of urine output, they may actually require sodium supplementation. So in general, what we would say, um, and uh, as opposed to adults, we generally do not uh, recommend uh, protein restriction. If a child has um, slightly higher levels of potassium or phosphorus, then that needs to be restricted as well. But all this, I think, has to be individualized to match the child's needs. Okay, uh, great. So another question is, how does a parent encourage a child with CKD to talk to their teachers, coaches, um, and friends about um, their, their conditions, but in a way they don't stand out or feel so different? Great, great, great question. So um, I think it is um, uh, we have to uh, make sure that we have such conversations um, at the health clinic visit so that the, we, uh, we inform them about what their kidney disease, what, that, what kind of kidney disease they have and how, it is, um, um, how that kidney disease um, may not, in, in most cases, have restrictions to their uh, level of activity or learning. So that is the first step to make sure that kidney disease is, does not ostracize a child. Um, it, is, uh, it may require uh, occasional changes maybe to their diet um, or um, occasional changes to their learning modality, but it doesn't mean that they have to be every time in, in specially treated. Are isolated. Thank you. So, what kind of different considerations are there with um, children and chronic kidney disease at different stages of childhood? So, you know, let's say you have younger, eight year old to 10 years old as opposed to teenagers. What are some major challenges within the different age groups of childhood? Right, right. So um, uh, the the important thing is uh, to realize that the changes mirror some of the developmental changes that happen at the same time. So um, a young child um, uh, needs may be a little different, whereas, say, an adolescent, um, the challenges that we face uh, with adolescents really is adolescents per se do not want to be very different. So they do not, they want their life to be as normal as possible. So stressing on um, the fact uh, um, of uh, adherence to maybe medications, maybe simplifying their medication schedule may help to deal with problems that happen during that phase of life. Whereas in say young children, um, we are more focused on their growth, on their appetite and things like that um, and how to uh, provide nutrition, how to accept, how to um, um, think about those needs as opposed to, say, needs of adolescents. And how do parents work with their children to gradually become more self-sufficient in managing their condition? So right. let's say, for instance, a child is about, you know, they're 16, 17, they're about to go off to college. How does a parent um, empower them to take more of the responsibility and actually ensure that they're ready to self-manage without parent intervention. Right, right. Um, so I, I think this is um, um, continues to be a work in progress, but the important thing is to uh, have graded responsibility. And I think um, it's an important concept as we look at development of what um, um, the conversations about kidney disease have to start early, and then the responsibility of, uh, of managing things have to be done one at a time. It may be that you are responsible for taking um, morning medications or afternoon, or much more, or maybe uh, a little more lenient would be the night medications because you are not rushed to school. And then um, having still some supervision to make sure it happens. And then as they progress, increase their responsibility. I think the, the, the important thing here is to start early and be persistent 
um, with the changes that happen during any teenage years. Okay, another question is what is a healthy GFR for a child with one kidney? So, um, great question, great question. So, for um, the, the um, GFR um, is actually a functional assessment of the kidney. So truly, the same number applies to either one kidney or both kidneys because it's a composite score. So a normal GFR for both kidneys is more than um, um, 90 and above, and that would be the same for a single kidney as well. And do you know of a website that offers a visual presentation for children to understand mineral and bone disease? Great. Um, um, both. I think um, so the website, there are some pictures in, even in the American Kidney Fund, as well as in the NKF website that discusses about uh, changes that can happen with bone disease. And I have utilized um, these sites to really explain this uh, um, phenomenon. So how does a parent um, help their child understand their kidney condition? Is there an easy or recommended way to explain it to them? Are there resources a parent can seek out to help them have a conversation about that? Right, as I um, um, alluded in the presentation, I think um, have we do have some handouts that are available for that we utilize. I think some of them actually from American Kidney Fund um, to talk about it. We utilize our child life workers to a great extent, uh, really, to have conversation at that developmental level. Um, so and that they would be a wonderful resource for you um, to explain in, in um, child-friendly terms and in appropriate fashion about understanding kidney disease and uh, and what changes happen, absolutely. So the team approach, so utilize your team. You're not alone. Okay, thank you. Another one is, how can I simplify the medicines, tests, and follow-up um, for my child with kidney disease to create a balance in their life? <laughs> Great. So, um, well, um, the important thing here is to um, have a conversation with your um, healthcare providers to balance again the need for monitoring versus um, the need to maintain um, relative normalcy. In the early stages of kidney disease, um, your, you can time your visits and your uh, blood work and lab draw all to um, maybe once in um, um, four to six months. Um, and you can time it at the time of breaks, and therefore you can have um, uh, during either a school break or a winter break, a lot of my patients do that. Um, once the kidney disease advance, advances, then um, it's important to check and make sure that you don't have any surprises. So at that time, we try to see whether we can combine our blood draws and our visits, um, and that way, Say on a, on a, you can do a blood draw on a weekend. That way, you don't have to miss a, um, a school visit, a school a school day, and then come and see on some of the off days. Um, so I think it's important to again have um, um, conversations with the healthcare team to accommodate that. Okay. Next question: What is the prognosis for steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome? And so um, uh, it is, it depends, I think, on what the um, actual change in the biopsy is um, with steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. I think that is an important. And what your, uh, when you start off with uh, steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, whether you have alteration in kidney function. So if the biopsy shows um, it is minimal change, then the chances of chronic kidney disease is relatively less when compared to say something like uh, having um, focal segment of glomerulosclerosis, where if you are steroid resistant and have that, your chances of having chronic kidney disease 
goes close to about 50 to 60 percent. Okay. How many years can someone take immunosuppressants um, and there are adverse effects for long-term use? There are. Um, I'm, I think the, the, this, uh, my view is that probably this is related to kidney transplant. Um, I would say, or is it steroid? So it depends, I think, the, the, the question. If it is really a renal transplantation where we do prescribe immunosuppressive medications to prevent rejection, you take it as long as you have a functioning renal transplant. Um, there are uh, long-term implications on this, but the overwhelming um, favor is to preserve kidney function, and therefore you continue to take it. Um, the, the important thing for these, um, for the side effects of uh, having immunosuppressive medication, is to prescribe the lowest effective dose, really. Thank you. If a child gets a kidney transplant, how likely are they to need another one in their lifetime? How likely? Um, at the present moment, very likely that they would. Um, but as I said, we looked at this at our, um, uh, in one of the slides that I showed that the um, graft survival rate is increasing um, uh, pretty much, I think, every decade or so. Um, currently, a living donor transplantation um, a functioning graft, uh, almost 80% of them survive for more than 10 years. But having said that, it may be that uh, it is very likely that you would require a second transplant at the present moment if you have a, um, a kidney transplantation because you are looking at a lifetime. Okay, next question. Do most children with CKD visit the dietitian regularly? Um, I, yes, they would. At the time of um, initial uh, visit and diagnosis for all the um, um, correct restrictions uh, or um, supplementation that is needed, yes. But in subsequent visit, if there are not many changes, then they may not require. But any time you have a change or if questions arise, uh, in our practice, generally when they start at the, the beginning of school year, a lot of our children would have to revisit that issue so that the school is well informed and our dietitians take a lead role on that. Um, so what about sports, sports, Dr. Srivast? For children with one kidney, do you, how do you feel about them playing sports? Don't see a whole lot of restrictions with them um, having a single kidney. Not a whole lot of restrictions. Occasionally, uh, people would restrict things like, um, um, say, field hockey or ice hockey so you don't get hit, but that is a rarity. So for most part, I don't think you require much of restriction provided your blood pressure is well controlled. Okay, and another question. Uh, what are your recommendations for taking antibiotics prophylactically for people with solitary kidneys? Um, is back from a recommendation? Uh, the, I think the, the uh, reason you get prophylactic antibiotics is most, more to do with whether um, you have um, a reflux, which is um, urine backing up into the kidney. Um, and a single kidney means you are worried about preserving the kidney function. And in that situation, if you have reflux, and if you have a single kidney, a lot of us would think about using prophylactic antibiotics and usually using uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxyl, which is part of Bactrim, yes. Okay, here's an interesting question. What steps can be taken to prevent anorexia in pediatric patients? <laughs> so uh, that is, I, I don't think we have great trials regarding that. Some, some uh, providers would use... Um, um, prohepatidine, periactin, which is sometimes given in, um, chil uh, in children without even kidney disease to increase their appetite. Um, occasionally, um, um, people have used um, um, mag uh, things like medroxyprogesterone to increase appetite, but I don't think we have great studies um, to counter anorexia. 
truly. Okay. And can a child function with one kidney? What if their function is 73%? Can it stay at this level? Uh, a, a child can function. A, a single kidney um, um, can definitely have a good function for, and, and can support your lifetime. Um, that is no question. But a single kidney with a lower function, um, you have to pay close attention to what happens uh, down the line, really. Um, a 73% is slightly lower than normal, so that means that um, you really have to see what happens over time to see whether it's going to stay at the same level. Okay, and next question. Can nephrotic syndrome impact a child's chances for transplant? Um, so having active nephrotic syndrome can um, impact. Uh, if you require a transplant and you still have active nephrotic syndrome, Yes, it may impact um, um, the uh, renal transplantation, but I think that needs to be discussed at the individual um, provider and patient level. Okay, and are children prioritized on transplant wait lists? Absolutely, yes. So we, um, and the kid, the 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 short answer is absolutely yes. They are prioritized so that um, you look and make sure that the kidneys, um, the best kidneys go to the children. Absolutely. Okay, uh, let's see. Can a child's sibling donate a kidney if they are under the age of 18? No, we, they cannot, uh, not at the, uh, no, not in the US. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how, involved should children be in their treatment, if at all? Or does it depend on their age and what kind of different types of involvement should there be at different ages? Right, so I, I think um, the, kidney, the short answer is that children have to be engaged in their treatment. Um, maybe not as um, um, infants or young children, but after that I think they have to understand the why of the disease, why they are um, taking medications, um, and why they may have some changes when compared to the rest of the family. Um, and that conversation, as I talked about before, um, had to be at that developmentally age-appropriate level to really make them understand of why they are doing some things. Um, it always uh, is important to engage them and become, and they then become part of a solution rather than problem. Okay. okay. And... Let's see, are most cases of pediatric kidney disease genetic? Um, if so, is there a way to prevent that? Well, wow. um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a loaded question. So really, I, I think we are realizing that a lot of um, uh, causes of kidney disease in children is genetic. Um, um, it ne need not be inherited all the time, but it could be due to either a genetic mutation or due to a a genetic alteration in the risk of why you get a kidney disease. Um, I think we are at the stage of understanding it more. Um, the next step would be in whether we can change it or prevent it, really. I don't think we are at that stage yet, but clearly I think this knowledge is um, exponentially expanding, really. And another question about um, a donor, can an adult give their kidney to a child? Yes, yes, yes. If they are, so the, the, the main um, thing we think about are whether they are a blood group match um, and whether they're healthy um, without having diseases that can affect the kidney. Things like diabetes or high blood pressure, then you may not be a, a good donor. Uh, but the donors get extensively tested to make sure that they are healthy and they can donate, and they, they do not uh, come into harm. Exactly. So is pediatric kidney disease considered a disability? Uh, that actually, I do not know the answer to that question. I think 
that is a question that may be uh, posed to my social worker uh, or a social worker in your healthcare team to really get the answer. Okay, and another question. Is decline in kidney function from nephrotic syndrome permanent or can it be recovered? Um, so, right, I think um, we, the important thing, uh, even when we define chronic kidney disease, we uh, said that the, there could be a decline in kidney function, but that decline should be at least for three months or more. So I think even nephrotic syndrome, you can have, uh, as opposed to other conditions, you can have temporary changes in kidney function, which then can normalize. Uh, and we see that sometimes. Um, but if you have alteration of kidney function, that is with a decline in your kidney, in your filtration element persistent for more than three months, that's when you think about um, this being chronic. Okay. So what can a parent do to make um, their child's life more, more normal throughout their illness? For example, what are some good activities to distract them during dialysis? Sure, great. Um, the things that we um, often uh, do, we actually, uh, during um, our, in our dialysis unit, uh, depending upon the um, um, uh, age appropriate level, uh, try to see whether we can utilize that time to actually um, do school activities. And we have some school liaisons in our unit who would help with some school work as well. So even though um, it is a treatment uh, time uh, for dialysis, it is during school hours, so you can do school work. So that would be something to think about. Um, for young children, we have um, uh, distraction stations and that would engage them in other activities that would help them um, engage during dialysis. Okay, and can children get depressed with kidney disease and how can parents, teachers support them and help them? Absolutely, uh, um, good question. So yes, children can. Um, it is. Um, uh, particularly as the severity of kidney disease worsens, um, the depression rates get higher. Um, and it is the first thing is to make sure that people are aware about this. So um, currently as a mandate, we would make sure that our children are screened for depression so that we recognize um, certain subtle changes um, with regards to their function is not due to depression. Um, the um, if you have, if you're lucky, you're lucky enough to have a, 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 a renal psychologist, then um, having a conversation with them about approaches uh, to tackle this and approaches to um, make adjustments uh, for dialysis is also important. So again, um, I would answer that utilize your team really to, to help you with in, in these to wade to, to these tricky areas. Okay, thank you. So here's another question. Do children with healthy kidney transplants have decreased life expectancy compared to children without kidney disease? Yes. Yeah, so the um um the um life expectancy of after, uh, after a, a kidney transplant is much better than during dialysis, but it is still lower than somebody who is uh, with no kidney disease. Um, absolutely, and the and the uh, reasons are um, the reasons of why we have lower life expectancy um, with, with children with kidney disease, even after transplant, is again to do with cardiovascular health. Really paying attention to blood pressure, paying attention to um, changes that can happen. Um, cardiovascular health is, is very, very important. Okay, we have time for one final question. Are there any um, pediatric kidney support groups for my child or that I as a parent can join? Yes, there are. I think, again, the websites of uh, your, your website to American Kidney Fund, I think, would give you um, um, resources to really utilize for such um, uh, parental websites. 
Um, there are um, other um, foundations, such as, uh, say, for children with um, nephrotic syndrome, there is a Nefcure Foundation, which has a parent support group as well. So I would encourage you to really look at these websites to get the right to get to the right group and have a support group. Okay. Um, well, thank you again, Dr. Shivas, for joining us and um, just answering so many questions about um, pediatric kidney disease. Very, right. very helpful. Thank I you. Really it. Thank you. Uh, so next month we will have two webinars. The first is How to Slow Down the Progression of Kidney Disease, which will be held on Thursday, September 20th and hosted by Dr. Randy Chen. The other is Tips for Talking with Your Doctor, and that will be held on Tuesday, September 25th and hosted by Dr. Sagar Nigwikar. Registration for both is now open. Visit kidneydisease.org slash webinars for more information and to register. Just to note, when the webinar closes, please do not close your browser window. You may see a pop-up saying that the webinar has ended. So please close that pop-up and proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us make our webinar program the best it can be. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.